delighted to be welcoming um, the final panel of the day. Um, speaking of the value of events, um, this panel is called Summing Up, Prove Your Value. And here to talk about this, we have, um, well, I'll, I'll leave it to um, the moderator, Robert Livingston from Games Bids to introduce the panelists. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to uh, get into this chat. Uh, we got a great panel um, for summing up, prove your value. Uh, and I guess we're the anchor panel here. I think we're, we're, we're finishing things up for the day. I know there's a conclusion, but uh, we're the last panel. So we're going to talk about how are rights holders structuring their financial models, monetiz monetizing their rights and using technology to demonstrate the value of their uh, brands and how important are data data analytics and DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion criteria for hosts and events to show their impact and credibility? <clears throat> and how are sports properties changing the way they commercialize their rights? So let me introduce first uh, Babakar Dieng. He's a, a digital and technology commission member of the International Olympic Committee. Uh, he's a database administrator and systems analyst as well. And Babakar was named an IOC Young Leader for his great community volunteer work for youth and sport. Um, looking forward to hearing a, a bit more of his story later on. Uh, also, uh, Matt Pound, Managing Director of World Ta Table Tennis. Matt started with the International Table Tennis Federation in 2013 and worked his way up and is now part of the commercial entity World Table Tennis. And Mihir Wardy, uh, he's the Chief Strategy Officer of World Rugby. Uh, Mihir has worked in media and sport for 20 years and his role at World Rugby encompasses strategic transformation, communications, women's rugby, diversity and sustainability. I'm Rob Livingstone. I'm founder and journalist at gamesbids.com. And uh, I've been writing and talking about the Olympic bid process for about 25 years. So um, let's get into it. I saw a prevalent theme here at the conference. Uh, change has been a big theme. Of course, last two or three years uh, have forced so much change upon us. Uh, the question to me is, is, are these changes permanent or are they gonna go back to the old ways? Um, or perhaps a blend of both. Um, so I guess my first question to Babakar, uh, let me ask you about the uh, IOC and technology since you're kind of the root of that, you're at the root of that. So much has been different uh, in the past two Olympics. Um, what technology has the IOC delivered to support the federations? And what do you think needs to be delivered moving forward? Hi, Mr. Livingston, hey, uh, dear all, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, yeah, as you said, uh, I'm a member of the uh, IOC Digital uh, and uh, Technology Commission, and uh, this is since uh, 2019. And yeah, uh, since the last couple of days, last couple of years, I mean, um, you know, our mission is not to force the Federation or the NOC. We, we usually work with the NOC and the International Federation. But uh, our mission is not really to force them using our own technology. We can inspire them, we can uh, advise uh, and support them use our technology during the uh, Olympic Games or the US Olympic Games. And uh, one issue with that event, uh, they are free to use our uh, our technology. And if that, uh, we can uh, support them that using uh, this technology and we have seen uh, some federations that are copying our a way to communicate uh, the way we use to 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 record our events the way to 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 protect our cyber security you know uh, this is how you and not uh, mandatory to to use exactly what we we have uh, during the the games to all to them to, to come to us to stay, ask if uh, they can use ours or not. If they are free to use their, their own, uh, it's okay, but uh, uh, not really mandatory, as I told you. Yeah. So, is there anything um, new, anything that, that's come up, uh, you know, during this pandemic that's been embraced and perhaps, you know, you're the, the federations are taking advantage. Is there any example that you can think of, or is it just part of the, the regular planning process? Yeah, uh, as you can see, the event that we have organized so, so many uh, uh, digital digital event like uh, to 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 make the promotion of uh, how we can 
how we can uh, empower people, how we can people uh, through the digital to, 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 to get active and also uh, trying to, to sell their, their events. So yeah, uh, this is how the IOC actually is trying to reflect and uh, uh, bring the other international federation and other organization to, um, to, 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 to follow this lineup. And uh, recently we have organized the Olympic Day and you have seen uh, we are using uh, we are using a uh, way to publish our event uh, saying that people this is how you can this is you can add this in order to reach your your population and uh, this is yeah what we are doing actually okay thank you thanks um, uh, to you Matt uh, let's look at right holders rights holders first can you explain um, why the ITTF uh, launched a commercial entity? And also, secondly, can you tell us a bit more about the modern sports property and how it might have changed uh, in 2022? Hi, Robert. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Big welcome from Tokyo. Early morning here. Um, so good, good question. In 2018, 2019, ITTF took a, a deep look of its commercial performance and its event performance. Running business inside an international federation is not easy. Um, it has a lot of different mechanisms to be looking at um, development of the sport, the rules regulation, um, and look, looking at, after every single member association around the world. So a lot of, a lot of things to think about and, and often the commercial business and the event business gets forgotten about. So table tennis, a, a sport with a rich hit history, um, created in 1926, was our first world championships. Um, everyone around the world has um, played table tennis. So we, we wanted to create an entity that every day they woke up and they thought about how to grow the business of table tennis, how to create better events, how to ensure people are watching the sport more, how to improve our TV production, how to improve our, our, our digital and, and social remit. So. Um, World Table Tennis was born, um, an entity fully owned by the International Table Tennis Federation, but also gives us the flexibility of selling equity into the company to, to get more money into the sport to supercharge our product as well. So um, in 2018, 2019, went through this process, we completely remodeled our events um, to, to give ourselves the best chance to be talking to host cities, to be pro providing them more value, to um, be providing our, our fans the best possible product. And we, we were geniuses and launched everything in um, 2021 during, during the midst of the pandemic. Um, could not have been worse timing, but we're here to tell the story still. Um, we're able to get events up and running the, the last couple of years and completely Re reshaped, remodeled, and repositioned the, the sport of table tennis with table tennis, of course, at its core, but also focusing on on entertainment, on on digital presence, and giving the fans a a, a deep look um, and enjoying table tennis, a sport that everyone's loved and played around the world. Thanks, Matt. Um, so over to you, Mihir. Uh, so more, more on change. Uh, can you explain why rights holders may be looking to change your financial models and, and structures? Sure. Uh, nice to meet you, Robert. And hello, everyone from West London. Uh, really pleased to be on this call and on this panel. Um, really, really interesting question and echoes much of what uh, Matt was, was saying there. For those not familiar with World Rugby, uh, we're the International Federation for Rugby Union. Our main brand, our main uh, presence in the world is the uh, Rugby World Cup. The last Men's Rugby World Cup was in Japan in 2019. And it's the third largest uh, spectator event in the world. Um, so that alongside the Seven Series, which we also run, and we have presence at the Olympics through Sevens as well, means that uh, we have a number of, of, of major properties. And what we've seen very much is both opportunity plus challenges coming together. And I guess the pandemic has given us a window to reflect on those and think where we go in the future as a rights holder. And certainly in terms of challenges, um, I think we're seeing some plateauing of rights fees um, and broadcast fees that we're able to uh, attain. And we're seeing in, in, in many sports, that's the case, not, not ubiquitously, but certainly in many sports. We're seeing um, the cost of hosting events, even before the current cost of living crisis, uh, increasing and being a challenge. And I think for us as a sport in particular, 
we have a little challenge in terms of limited number of hosts we can go to given the scale of our event and the presence of our sport as a major sport in only a few markets perhaps around the world. Uh, in terms of opportunities though, looking alongside that, what we have certainly identified, and I think similar to what we just heard from Matt, is the ability to commercialize our events in ever increasing volumes and, and value, certainly looking at the you know, better connections and engagement with our fan base, uh, driving more value from the data we can uh, achieve there. And therefore, last only last month, actually, when we announced the next five Rugby World Cups um, in terms of hosting, we, we've actually looked very hard at our approach. And historically, we would um, have a tender process, invite people to bid. Um, and we've, we've, to some degree, flipped that on its head, whereby looking beyond 2025 at those five World Cups, we're looking to uh, partner with with hosts, with our, our member unions, but take on much more ownership of the delivery of those events. And that means that, for example, we're able to propose hosting World Cups in for the first time in the Americas, uh, in the USA, in 2031, the Men's World Cup, and 2033, the Women's World Cup, which we may not be able to have done uh, just through our, our member union there, but by doing it in partnership with ourselves and taking on more responsibility, uh, we're able to, to deliver those World Cups in, in hopefully a more effective fashion. So those are the sort of ways that uh, we certainly as a rights holder are, are looking to evolve and, and change. Thanks for here. Um, so back to you, Babakar. I, I know you have a close connection with Senegal um, and they're hosting the Youth Olympic Games in uh, 2026 now, I guess. So the Youth Olympic Games have been described as a laboratory for, for testing new sports, new concepts, that kind of thing. Um, and we've seen mainstream, new mainstream sports come out of it, um, breaking, skateboarding, that kind of thing, be, becoming popularized, starting in the Youth Olympic Games laboratory. Um, and we've even seen other concepts in Buenos Aires that had that great open air uh, um, street opening ceremonies. Um, and and mm -hmm. that's going to happen in Paris in 2024, kind of, a kind of similar concept. So um, mm -hmm. just from that, from that perspective, um, I'm just curious what else is coming out of the Youth Olympic Games and that, that relates to technology, digital technology, perhaps. Um, can you tell me if there's any new digital technology, um, like engagement driving tools that are coming out that we can expect in the future? Are you experimenting with anything new in the, in the Youth Olympic Games? Yeah, um, I think yeah. Usually, we say the Youth Olympic Games are the laboratory of the Olympic uh, brand. But I think, like uh, as uh, every year, uh, all uh, big company, uh, every time, what you if you use to organize an event, uh, you're trying to improve it uh, better and better. And uh, uh, even like we had not the York, uh, we would say like every previous game would be like a laboratory for the next game. The reason why, yeah, we used to test something uh, during the actual games and trying to improve it in the next game or seeing if it can be used or not during the next game. And uh, yeah, but the York are not really uh, the laboratory. We use, it's like uh, the games. There are some big events, like some big games uh, where we use some technology and during the next one, we're not going to use it because it's not really, uh, it don't it, it don't give so much benefit. But uh, for the York, uh, for the next coming ga games, uh, in that, I think like the, the engagement from uh, about the technology was the same as the previous game because, uh, you know, Africa is not a, a, a continent where people really use uh, the technology to, to, to engage. It, we, we need to go to the field and actually we are we already uh, start this way uh, our our organization committee is going to the field directly to engage people and we are trying to reflect on how we can impact really population uh, by technology but for that uh, it have a beginning the beginning is that uh, people should use a lot their uh, smartphones using their their uh, their public uh, computer you know reason why but I think it will be uh, really something really new uh, once seen in doing previous game and uh, I don't think we'll see that in next coming games 
about the technology, but uh, uh, the way we're going to communicate, the way we're going to, 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 to make the marketing, the way we're going to have the cyber security will be more improved because uh, we have more spread uh, you know, like uh, when I talk about cyber security, it will be, we will have more threat because we are not uh, so much protected in terms of cyber security in Africa. So yeah, uh, we will have an improvement on this side and uh, there will be also uh, many, uh, like we will, maybe we will give some more uh, device to people in order to let them know uh, that uh, sport had this power to to engage people and uh, trying to reach to to bring them practicing more i think it was the last uh, the last uh, point we, we we retained for from our commission last time and uh, we are trying to discuss more on how we can uh, more be be more impactful on next coming coming games Thanks. I know one thing that's absolutely certain is that when you combine uh, young people, you combine technology and you um, push that out four years, nothing's certain. That's the only thing that's certain. So um, to, to you, Matt, uh, again about change. We're seeing so many new sports gain popularity due to culture change. And older sports such as uh, modern pentathlon, they're being forced to adapt quickly. So how do traditional sports stay relevant? Yeah, that's, that's a question that we have to ask ourselves every day, especially live sports where we had to take a bit of a break for the last couple of years. People got used to being on their phones, watching their sports on TV with empty stadiums and consuming their daily lives in a completely different way. So us as sporting properties, we need to, we need to stay relevant. We need to be offering the fans a product which they're going to be using um, their hard-earned cash, which um, the cost of living every day is getting more and more expensive. So um, if they're going to come and buy a ticket and get transport and buy a Coke and some popcorn to come and watch a sporting event, we need to be putting on a good show. So is we have to be looking at our event formats, our timing, is just the sport enough? Or do we need some, some dancers, some singers, music, lights, entertainment, fan engagement through through technology to entice people to come and, and watch your sport. Um, table tennis is a is a prime example and the, the transformation that we have, have been going through. We we're, um, changed the, the format of events. We've um, shortened our sessions. Before you would come to a table tennis event and only the hardcore fans would come from 9 a.m. To, to 10 p.m., many tables no sport presentation, no real show, but now we're, we're having one table in unique smaller venues, that intimate experience. We only want the fan to come from, from 7 p.m. to 9 or 10 p.m., come and watch a couple of games. We have some tables outside to people to come and hit some balls. Everyone likes playing table tennis, come have a beer, um, be entertained and a short, sharp experience because people uh, don't have time um, then they want to be entertained and they don't just want one specific experience. They don't just want to come and watch a table tennis match for, for five hours. They want to come and watch some table tennis um, and, and be completely entertained. And, and we're all competing now in completely different spheres. Um, table tennis is not just competing with um, badminton or rugby or tennis anymore. We're competing with um, Netflix, with Candy Crush, with a Taylor Swift concert so many so many different things so we have to stay relevant and stay on the top of our game to ensure that someone's going to be spending their hard-earned cash on a on a table tennis ticket as a opposed to um renewing the the netflix subscription or something like that so always always having the fan first and providing something relevant for the fan that they can enjoy and um and choose uh that friday night to come watch table tennis instead of um going to see tom cruise and top gun Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Um, so something I, I follow closely are Olympic Games bids. So Vancouver and British Columbia, they're, they're bidding to host the uh, 2030 Winter Games. Um, and there was a motion drafted by one of the uh, city councillors to hold a plebiscite, to hold a referendum over, over the bid. And one of the things she noted, noted because I, you know, I'm one of those people that reads these motions very closely because uh, I'm interested in those, but she mentioned that 
in the Beijing 2022 games, the uh, the um, TV ratings fell dramatically. Um, and she surmised that based on that, um, there would be less revenues in 2030 that would hit the bottom line. So the financial models that, that Vancouver is going forward with aren't valid. Now, I think on our panel and, and many, list, many listening can can understand or notice some of the flaws in, in that logic. So, um, you know, that, that those, you know, what people believe, politicians, what people believe are sometimes, you know, um, you know, the reality as far as how it impacts, um, you know, sports properties. So I guess a question for me here, um, how, how are we, how are we measuring these results, the results from hosting these events? Um, wh what are the results that we're measuring? And can you tell us what uh, evidence best demonstrates the, the impact that they have? It's, it's an interesting question. And the example you raise is, is an interesting one. And I think it depends whose prism you're looking at these things through and um, from what perspective. So for a commercial partner, a sponsor or a broadcast partner, the, the point raised about, for example, that Vancouver example, is valid. Um, that is something that one would have to take into account in terms of thinking about the impact of an event um, and its, its global impact, its global revenues. Um, so I think that's that's not unreasonable, but obviously there are a range of partners involved and here obviously at host, host cities, we're talking particularly about, about hosts. I'd say also from those commercial partners though, as well as sheer volume of audience, I think increasingly we're seeing more scrutiny over the level of engagement of audiences. The type of audience clearly has always been important uh, to, to, to any, any um, sponsor or commercial partner in terms of uh, socioeconomic grouping, the diversity of our audience and, and, the, and the reach and the unique audience also you, you get. I think what uh, we've also seen, and I've seen a sea change in this previously to this job I worked in advertising, and um, you know, in the in the 2010s or so, we were seeing much more focus on just you know how many tweets a, a a product can get or how many Facebook likes. And I think the world has very much moved on, obviously, to interpreting those sort of stats and information in, more in terms of value um, rather than just thinking about simply getting uh, getting ridiculously large numbers of, of tweets and likes. And that's certainly something from a commercial point of view. We've 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 get, got better at understanding and interpreting. But if we look at it from a sort of host point of view, I guess the traditional metrics still ma matter um, in terms of um, the ability to attract um, tourists, ability to attract spectators, ability to attract revenues to a particular location or, or set of locations. Um, and what we certainly look and to do is assess that in as independent a fashion as possible. I think that's really important to be um, you know, genuine in your stats. My background is an economist, so so certainly feel Feel strongly about that and in terms of so the metrics there's obviously direct economic impact there's there's obviously tax take that one might have um so for example on, on ticket sales and things like that and looking ahead and, and looking at where we are now i guess there's also a focus which we're, we're trying to get our heads around more and more in terms of the broader social impact of of hosting events um which plays into obviously diversity agenda but also the greater social returns one can have from hosting a, a major event. And that's aligned to some degree with what one might be able to measure in terms of a brand impact. Um, and we're very proud of the values of our sport and that brings brand impact obviously for our commercial partners, but also for the hopefully the hosts we work with, it also brings um, added value to them as well. So those are the sort of areas that I think historically we've, we've focused on in terms of measuring and, and trying to assess as well as where, where trends are heading in the future. Thanks. Um, you know, I know with that Vancouver example, I think we're all aware that by 2030, TV ratings aren't going to be a valid measurement. Um, they, there's, you know, digital, all kinds of digital channels that are that are on the increase um, to make up for that. And, and also contracts for 2030, a lot of them are already signed. Um, so, so Matt, um, can you weigh in on this as well? I'd like to hear um, your take and, and maybe how do you convince politicians, the, the general public, um, the, the other, the positive impacts of hosting these events that aren't, you know, related to TV ratings. Yeah, and that's, um, every city is different. Every city has different, different objectives of what they want to be achieving from a sporting event. Some, some cities are purely looking for heads on bed. So to have the in, inbound tourism that's going to 
come and sleep at their hotels, drink, um, eat, eat food at their restaurants, drink beer at their pubs and come and, and enjoy a sporting event that, um, that's attracting people to be traveling in from, from that country. So um, that's important for a lot of cities. Other cities are looking for pure brand exposure. So they wanna be seen um, on, the, on the floor or the, the surrounds um, internationally through, through TV broadcast um, and being seen um, to be attracting tourism that way. So um, having that, that identity, um, it's always a competition for the cities as well. Um, other cities just want to um, encourage healthy living. So to be bringing a sporting event to be inspiring the, the next generation of talent to, to come and play the sport. So we do a lot of work um, with our host cities to be putting up tables around the city and the country to be encouraging the youth, not just the youth, but um, everyone to be coming out and, and playing table tennis because it's a very healthy hobby that everyone can enjoy and everyone can play. It's not, not like Formula One or, or UFC. Um, you can put a table anywhere in the city and everyone will, will start playing it and also be engaging in, through schools and through the member association and all the different clubs to ensure that as many people are, are getting active as possible. So um, may, many different metrics for, for the cities, but um, we, we always sit down with whoever we are holding an event with and, and work through their, their key strategic um, items and, and ensure we're, we're ticking all the boxes there because every, everyone's got different different ways and we have a lot of tools in our chest that we can be ac activating and, and ticking those boxes so they have a satisfying experience and, and they can be justifying the ROI and the cash that they're investing into our event. Thanks, Matt. So um, we're, we're just uh, running, uh, we've just got a couple minutes left, but Mihir, um, uh, this one's for you. We've uh, spent a couple of years being forced to change almost everything we do. Um, but what are barriers to change in the future? What, what do you see as uh, those barriers to change? As a rights holder, I think there's probably um, two main, main barriers to change. Um, and We've been on actually a very similar journey to the ITTF in terms of thinking about our role as an international federation and as a regulator, as well as as a commercial entity on the other hand. And I'd say one key barrier to changing as an economic entity, as a commercial operator is governance um, and the ability to liberate um, the event side of a business or the commercial side of a business uh, in a way that uh, traditional federations may, may struggle with. Um, and, you know, potentially obviously get um, different sorts of partnerships involved as well. So I think that's, that's, that's one of the, one of the, one of the challenges. I think the other one is, is, is really interesting is, and it's really personal right now is that there are a number of federations all trying to do very similar things in terms of ride for crest of a wave around, um, the explosion of digital and data op opportunities and therefore access to the sort of skills right across the range of things we want to do is is a really real challenge for us and i'm sure for other rights holders as well and both being able to address those challenges for the here and now but also for where all those changes are going to lead in in, in the future and obviously um you know it's very difficult to both predict those changes but also to upskill yourself to be able to take an opportunity off them uh, to the maximum in the, in the future. So I think those are the two key things that uh, certainly keep us awake at night. So looking at five years, um, you know, we're at Host Cities America 2027. What are we going to be talking about? What do you think is going to change between then and now? And what are going to be the, what, what will be the hot talk topics as far as sports properties and um and brands um over to you matt go ahead <laughs> yeah well i hope we're we're not talking about COVID 19 anymore that's for sure <laughs> and i hope um i hope we're all um in person and not online i hope that's just a a, a bad memory of of the past but i i think we're, we're just going to be continuing this this road of innovation and um embracing technology at events <laughs> No, no longer do you have to, to line up for, for your beer, but um, ordering it through your app and um, connecting and learning much more stat intensive information about the game through your phone and 
been able to to connect on the journey with the players and athletes through social media and um, engaging much more in the city through through your phone and 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 different type of type of apps. I think the immersive experience in events are, are going to be much deeper, um, and then how fans can can be enjoying enjoying the event and having that immersive experience and have that gamification of how they are enjoying sports because um, that that barrier is going to become more and more blurred moving forward. Uh, Babakar, what, what's your what's your take on this? What do you think we're going to be talking about uh, five years from now? Yeah, I think like we're going more to talk about uh, the behavior of people also and uh, also the technology we can use to educate more people because uh, uh, that we that we really need actually in the in, in this world because uh, we see that people uh, not re really respect. I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, people that are in the field of sport. I mean, uh, they are not really respect the, the values we, we are defending and uh, they pretending uh, practicing sport, but not really leaving the, uh, the, the main values we are defending in the organization, in the IOC. So yeah, uh, we can talk about it and we can talk a uh, way to, to engage more people and be more impactful. Thanks. I I might have lost Babakar there. No, he's back. Okay. Um, so uh, I think we're out of time. We're out of time for this session. Um, but thanks so much to the panel today. A very interesting conversation. Thank you for joining Babakar, Matt, and here, um, and uh, for helping us, uh, I guess, close out the panels for the day. Uh, it's been quite a day. Uh, I've listened to quite a few of the panels and and a lot lot to learn. But um, I'll send it back to Ben. Thanks everyone. Thanks for watching.